and it's and it's not a very human friendly city in that sense user friendly city sure it's rich and it has all of these amenities and services but at the end of it when they start taxing people because they will start taxing people because it's starting to falter economically then who's going to stay in dubai right the most lucrative thing about it is the fact that you can get paid as an american you can get paid something like you know, to $240,000, $250,000 a year by virtually, you know, just existing there and, and working a regular job. But then if you're going to get taxed for that, then why leave? Do you know the uh, percentage of residential structures that are going out up and the people living in them? So that it's is like, a very, you cannot like, actually find statistics about that. Because the percentage of uh, residential structures are way greater than Mm -hmm. businesses. Mm -hmm. Why is that stimulating residential structure where it's built on this business aspect? So the thing that Dubai is doing, in, in that sense at least, is that they're really following the model of build it and they will come. So they're providing, kind of like the Chinese cities have been providing that we saw last lecture, they're providing a lot of excess <coughs> that is not being satisfied. And in addition to providing a lot of excess in residences, they're also providing a lot of excess in businesses because they're assuming that the business will grow at some point after they, they you know, continue consolidating all of these world connections into the city. But at the, end of it, at the end of it, it's not a sustainable policy. They're just building and most of the buildings are actually empty. But if you go and you try to find out a percentage of how much of the buildings are empty, you won't actually be able to reach that kind of information because it's being... Dubai is a very controlled yeah. city. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's an extremely controlled city in all aspects, not just in terms of you know the police force, which has jetpacks and like robocopters or something, but also in terms of the economy, in <coughs> terms of the political system, in terms of freedom of speech. None of these things actually exist, right? And if you speak out wrongly against the government, you will be deported within 24 hours and you have no choice. Even as an American citizen? Even as an American citizen. Even, they will deport people based on religion. Mm. And it's been happening. So, yeah. <laughs> the, the real question that um, we're not going to answer right now, but we've raised it before, is how is it economically viable to build a city that remains significantly empty? So there's no money coming in, rents, there's no office leases. How is that even possible that they can do that? And we saw that they did that in, uh, they've, they've done it in multiple examples. The key ones are in Shanghai and Pudong, when they built that Manhattan skyline across the Huangpo River. And it was largely empty for years and is still largely empty. And they even subsidize people. They say, we'll pay you to live over there. Um, how, how does that work? It's going to bubble. So yeah, it has to do with the way financial markets are working right now. Um, and we're not going to get into it, but it's an important thing for you to understand because there's a good chance that the architecture you are working on <coughs> Uh, at some points, or maybe even all points for some of you, will be driven by financial considerations independent of human need. You may design something that will never be occupied, ever. Like the top 244 meters of the Burj Khalifa. So is the top of the, is it just empty? It's empty. It's concrete floors and a facade. That's it. There's elevators that take you all the way to the top, but what are you going to do there? <laughs> you can do what? You can stop at the individual floors. Have nothing no. Okay, so no, no. There, there's a point before you hit those 244 meters where you cannot access anything else. I mean, sure, if you're maintenance and everything, you can go all the way up. But publicly, you can't. There's, there's nothing to do. It's not habitable up there. Is it Actually, because of the pressures or the environment? Or? 
it is, it's many things, but the pressure and env environment are definitely part of it. Like somehow, although they say that this is a state of the art building and it's a state of the art installation and state of the art everything, they still haven't managed to figure out how to get people all the way up there and then get them to live there. Because if you're living, you know, 700 meters above the ground, you're gonna have to take an elevator that's gonna shoot you at an extremely high speed to get to 700 meters. And that is going to be physically uncomfortable. We actually, They've engineered it so that the acceleration is not a big deal. Like they've mm. really finely studied it. I took a group of ten students. That's why students. it gets you to six hundred and fifty and not to. Yeah, but we yeah. went there <laughs> in September, and uh, we went to the observation deck. We didn't mm. pay for the VIP, but that was part of a course at at uh, Wentworth that mm. we actually did that walk through the mall that you mapped out so nicely. Um, the tentacles that go out. Yeah. We weren't there for very long, but it was part of the Emirates Airlines. It works. We weren't going to Dubai. We were going to Bali. But, mm. but the best way to get to Bali turns out to be to stop in Dubai for 12 hours, hotels included, thrown into the price of the plane ticket. Yeah, and now, I mean, I just saw this yesterday. They're subsidizing their air their airlines so much that you can actually fly to, there was an offer two days ago, you can fly to Milan for something like $700 for two people return trip through Dubai and you stay for a night at the hotel. Let's go. Like, before, yeah. you're in? before it falls. <laughs> go to the graduate yeah. school. Uh, actually, you're two years away from that. You might go, but uh, I won't be going to Bali when you guys, if any of you go to the graduate program. So, lots to think about. To a large extent, the only way you can make sense, you, you, your head should be kind of, you should be struggling with lots and lots of questions right now. Who's, who's struggling? Now, this is part of the strategy of teaching the course backwards, is uh, if the world is the, number one source of understanding. And we're using architectural tools, number two, to, to access that thing that is the world. Then we're starting with the world itself and trying to figure out what the heck is going on. Because you kind of have to to survive and to thrive in the coming century in the careers you've chosen. And so there's lots of big questions uh, that are difficult to figure out. We're not going to figure them all out here. We're basically uh, tormenting you with the complexity and the challenge of living in the world uh, uh, that will be your career, the context of your careers. Uh, that continues with this topic, automobility. Uh, as I said at the beginning, this is kind of the only topic that is United States centric. Everything, you notice we haven't been talking about the US much? You notice that? And this one is all about the US. And it's pretty much the only one that is really dealing uh, with the 20th century, the uh, century that produced the world that we now live in. And so, Guess what? There's too much to cover. Um, and in, uh, there's too much to cover. Uh, so that's why the notes you take today are going to be very important for your careers, I believe. Because we're basically going to make an outline. We're just going to create an outline of issues and questions and challenges for you to understand uh, in your, the careers that you're coming to. So first of all, uh, how many of you came to school today? I'm just checking to see if your hand works. Okay. How many of you came to school today uh, in a car? How many of you came to school today in a car that you drove? How many of you came to school today in a car that you drove because it's your car? So, when I asked those questions, uh, when I started teaching this class 12 years ago, oh my god, it was kind of reversed. It was like everyone came in cars that they drove. 
Uh, so it's changing, and there's a slide that shows this. What is changing? Uh, uh, are the things, remember that reading you did? Uh, so that reading ended with something very provocative. It said like, who saw the internet coming over the horizon? We didn't see it, but then boom, here it was. You may not realize, my kids don't realize that I didn't have smartphones and internet when I was their age. Um, but you know that, right? You know it's a new thing. So, um, they, uh, who saw, you know, the computer itself, uh, smartphones, the internet, all of these things went viral very quickly. It was a very abrupt change. He says, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it could happen, right? Is it happening? Smart cars. Smart cars, is that going to increase car usage or decrease car usage? Decrease. Increase? Uh, so driverless cars are going to increase uh, our use of cars. Um, one thing he says is, he says in 2100, we're not going to be driving around these 19th century steel and glass uh, gasoline producing uh, burning vehicles, right? Uh, and at some point it's going to change. It's either going to change abruptly or it's going to change gradually, but it's going to change. Here are some of the forces. Um, who knows? So, we love cars. Who's with me? Oh my God. No, it's a, we, so let's do it again. We love cars. Okay. We hate cars. I'm the only one who hates cars. No, I hate cars. I hate the, I hate the other people in those cars. <laughs> right. Which gets to the point in the reading, I don't know if you noticed this, his previous reading, which I was a huge fan of in 2000, talked about what happens to humans when they get behind the wheel. What happens to you when you get behind the wheel? <laughs> right. It kind of makes you, turns you into a sociopath somehow. Do you, do you feel that? So his claim is there are humans, and then there are humans in cars. And it's the same human, but there's a different mental operation going on. Like you're in, and he gets into it in this reading. I thought this is one of the greatest parts of the reading, is that when you are strapped in and you got your dashboard and your feedback, and you know, so you're driving along, you're driving along, you know, and you're kind of hooked into this system and you're responding to opportunities. Say, oh, light's yellow. <laughs> right? Uh, there's a bicycle in, in my way. The bicycle is not in front of me. The bicycle is not traffic. The bicycle is an obstacle, like a rock, only it's moving. <laughs> right? Um, so there's a, and whereas when you're walking, it's a, it's a completely different mentality. It's like you open the door for people, you don't, you very rarely bump into people. Because we're like making eye contact with people, we're aware of the space, we're very responsive. It's a very reflexive thing uh, when you're walking, but when you're driving, it's my road, it's my right of way. And I have, I'm an American citizen, and the Bill of Rights, I think it's the Fourth Amendment, it says, I have the God-given right of all humans in the US to a free parking space, right? And it's like, ugh, there's like this mentality. So I think, I'm surprised that there aren't more people who hate cars. I, I'm torn. I used to hitchhike across the country, and then I used to drive across the country, and then I used to take a motorcycle. I love driving across the country. It's so great. But I hate driving across the country. It's not great at all. I hate driving. I've never owned a car in my life. I bicycle everywhere. 
I'm like Dutch in this way. I have a Dutch bike and I take my kids, I have a passenger seat, I take my son to hockey. He's 18 years old and sometimes he just has to get to hockey. So I put his hockey bag on the front of my bike, and it's like this. He carries the stick and he sits on the back and I take him up the hills and we go to hockey. Um, so there's one thing, there's two aspects of this lecture, there's two aspects of the reading that I want you to pay attention to. One is the content issues, like cars and the systems of automobility are in and of themselves very important, very, very important. It's the most powerful force for changing the world. Uh, for the last hundred years, the North American continent was absolutely, fundamentally, and almost in its entirety transformed. No architecture alone could do that. It was an architectural <coughs> automobility transformation of the continent. So that's me reinforcing the fact that the content is very important. But even more important than that is the relationship between architecture, the built environment, and the mental <coughs> patterns, our habits of mind, who we are individually, and who we are as a society are so fundamentally structured, and I'm using that word very carefully, who we are as individuals and, and societies are, can be structured by architecture and the built environment. And it's hard to tell because it happens in very subtle ways. But we know who the winners and losers are, right? We know that the person in the fancy car is a winner. We know the person waiting at the bus station or the bus stop is a loser. It's just built into, we don't even think about it. It's just, that's the way it is. How many of you went to high school? Raise your hand. Go to high school. Okay. How many of you felt uh, social pressures in high school to be cool? Um, did cars have something to do with it? Cars had something to do with it. Right? Did you drive to class? Did you drive to school or not drive to school? Who drove to school at least sometimes in high school? How important was it that you do that, and why? Cars bring freedom. Freedom. Independence. Independence. What if you didn't drive a car? What What were the consecuences? Managing the time. So it's a time. It's a practical thing about time. You didn't have to catch the bus, which was on a strict timetable. But what else? If you didn't drive, because there were some days you didn't drive. What? There was never a day you didn't drive? Wow. So, so everyone but you, you're Karina, right? Um, so everybody but Karina, what was it like on the days that you didn't drive? What did it feel like? I drove every day too once I had walking. Okay. Someone was taking away my God-given right. Got... Someone was taking away my God-given right. <laughs> <laughs> what else? What did it feel like when you didn't drive? Tired. Tired? Because I was like, wake up so much earlier. Yeah. But then, like, also, like, once I started driving, like, I had, like, a, like, I could come into school late because I had, like, a sick. Okay. So like that was a, it was just like. Did you take the school bus? Before, yeah, and then my mom drove. What does taking the school bus feel like? <laughs> Who takes the school bus? <laughs> underclassmen. <laughs> yeah, underclassmen. Who else takes the school bus? <laughs> Kids who live in big cities. Okay, so 
this, you know, you went to high school, you know what social pressures are, you know how transportation can work. There is a pragmatic side to it, right? Sleeping in is a real benefit. There's also a social status thing to it too. Um, so the real important thing here as we go through here is automobile dependency in the United States. How did it happen that we that it became impractical to not drive. There are many places, most places in the United States, that it's not practical to live there without a car. As someone who's never owned a car, I, my choices are extremely limited on where to live. Um, how does it work? How does it, how does it operate? And how does it reproduce itself? And I, we've gone a long way to uh, getting at that. It reproduces itself certainly in the life experience of every suburban uh, high school student uh, in the United States because every suburban high school student in the United States has this experience. Losers take the school bus, winners uh, drive. Why did your mother make the sacrifice to drive you to school every day until you were old enough to drive yourself? Because she knew that you were going to be labeled a loser <laughs> if you took the school bus. Um, um, correct me if I'm wrong. I think so. You know what? I don't think so. You know? She just didn't want you to walk. She just didn't want you to walk because she loves you. Yeah. <laughs> so there are some variations within the spectrum, um, but you get the point. So we have a few topics to cover. Excuse me for picking up the pace a little bit and going, going silent on the interactivity part, but please interrupt, correct, overstatements, object, ask questions, because I'm going to go way too fast to do justice to these topics. So streetcar suburbs. What was there before automobility? There were streetcar suburbs. Examples, Boston was, you know, the city of Boston was this small thing on the peninsula, but then it expanded and expanded and took in all the streetcar suburbs. Brookline, Roxbury, Dorchester, this neighborhood. Everything here was built as a streetcar suburb. Streetcars go down the main avenues. Businesses locate along main streets. Rectangular parcels are part of this system. It's like, why do we put books in the bookcase like this with the narrow spine showing instead of like this? It's because there's more space in the bookcase for more books when you put the book in the bookcase this way and just show the spine so you can find it. Same logic. That's how the architecture of Main Street was produced. Uh, then, so these are the avenues, and these are the streets. These are all residential buildings, tree-lined streets with sidewalks, a little bit of parking and, and uh, narrow streets. But these are the main thoroughfares. And this is how, in the 1920s, every city in the United States expanded. Uh, and you can see in Baltimore, this is the housing types of one era and then the next era. But you see. The urbanization that grows out from the center along the spines of the streetcar suburbs. Here's St. Paul uh, in Minneapolis, the Twin Cities in Minnesota. And same thing. It's a pattern of streetcar lines that produce the fabric that are the city centers and the inner suburbs. These are streetcar suburbs built largely between the 1890s through to the Great Depression of 1929. And that was the golden period of streetcar suburbs. Los Angeles, we heard a little bit of the story. Um, and so now we're answering a few questions about Los Angeles. How did Los Angeles happen? Los Angeles is the most automobile-centric place in, on the planet, right? That's how we named the whole LA school after it, because of its automobile. What if I told you? That at one time, Los Angeles had the largest, most complete 
mass transportation system on the planet. Crazy talk, right? But it's true. Step one, bring water in. Step two, market the good life of California using palm trees and Hollywood symbolism. Step three, buy agricultural land for a dollar an acre. Step four, connect that agricultural land to the city center using a streetcar, and then build houses and market it for $100 an acre. You know, so you, now you have a hundredfold increase in the land value. Those aren't the actual prices, but it's a, it's a multiplier. So you have enough money from the increased land value produced by the ability to take a streetcar from this new home to downtown. So streetcars were a land development strategy. It was the key element of the land development strategy. It has been that way all over the world throughout history and still is, except in the United States, where there is a firewall between real estate development and mass transportation provision. No one in the United States uh, harvests the value, the increased value of the land from the transport system in order to fund the transportation system, even though that's the only way it was ever produced. So this is a pattern of the streetcar networks in Los Angeles from Santa Monica uh, to downtown, and it continued up to Pasadena, et cetera. Does that make sense? That's like an important reference point. Is it okay? Fordism. What is Fordism? We think of Henry Ford's big innovation was mass production, and he made it very inexpensive to produce automobiles. In 1907, the Model T sold for a dramatically lower price than any automobile had ever been sold for before. Previously, automobiles were for doctors making house calls, back when doctors made house calls, and rich people, because it was fun to go for a motor ride on, in the countryside on Sundays, right, for Sunday driving. Then Ford changed everything. Uh, he said two things. We, we know about this one, the mass production, and there it is, uh, thank you, Google. But the second thing is essential to being the idea of Fordism. Fordism is not just mass production to lower costs. Fordism has a second component. The second component is he paid his workers dramatically more money than factory workers, <coughs> the market for factory workers. And why would he do such a thing? Well, it says right there. I'm not going to ask you. We don't have time. Go ahead. Oh, well, no. I mean, just, um, he has the more than he actually the class of, of um, Americans that can afford to buy the car for a lower price. He created the consumer class capable of affording a car. So all of a sudden, it's not just for doctors and the wealthy 1%. Cars are for anyone working in his factory earning his wages can buy one of the cars that they're making. Radical. Next topic. See, that was one slide. That's how fast we're going. Architecture. This is the most, um, I'm embarrassed how quickly we're going to do this, but we'll come back to it next week in the Radiant City. So Corbusier, and others, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, all of these people, who, all of the architects operating around the time of the rise of the automobile, especially the Model T Ford, was suddenly it was a viable purchase for a lot of people in the United States and in Europe. Suddenly the automobile became the focus of attention of designers and architects. This idea of having a roadway or a transportation infrastructure uh, is, is a cartoonish exaggeration of the idea of a corridor city where you put your infrastructure in and the housing is, and the development is linked to that corridor of infrastructure. This is an extreme <coughs> architecturalized version of that where you go one room depth uh, away from the infrastructure and you're in the countryside. That's an extreme concentration 
of what was a big idea. Here's Corbusier uh, proposing uh, for the town of Algiers, the French colony uh, in Algeria, to have freeways that are buildings. So it's, it's an expansion of this idea where you arrive at the, uh, the government building by driving onto its roof off of the landscape. And you live in apartment complexes uh, that are below the freeway and everything else is open, more or less. And then uh, multiple, uh, during the 1920s, Corbusier had a lot of time on his hands and he developed four distinct uh, proposals for uh, utopian urban formations, big ideas, and we'll look at that next week. But just to, um, he had these ideas of cruciform housing towers that he had funded, funding from uh, one of France's largest automobile manufacturers in the 1920s to develop this plan for Paris. Who's been to Paris? Notre Dame, right there. Le Marais, one of the most wonderful areas of Paris. Um, Notre Dame, Le Marais, uh, the Louvre, Arc de Triomphe is still there. Uh, the Champs-Élysées, here's the Louvre, uh, but the rest, there's the Louvre right there. And his idea, funded by the automobile manufacturer of Voisin, was to bulldoze uh, the heart of Paris and build, uh, update it, get, get a, refresh, a refresher for Paris. So that's Architect's Dreams. Uh, the next one, um, we're getting deeper into how did this happen? Why in the United States did we go off in one direction that was dramatically different from the rest of the world that also had access to automobiles? Uh, well, partly it's because of the uh, dramatic intervention of a few individuals who happened to be the leaders of industry related to the automobile. And chief among those was General Motors. Uh, Sloan, the head of General Motors, who's the uh, patron of the Sloan Business School at MIT, he said famously, what's good for General Motors is good for the United States of America. And the government of the United States of America uh, believed that was true. And the lobby uh, in its day was the largest lobbying organization, most well-funded lobbying organization. I'm not sure what its status is today, but historically from the 1920s onward, the automobile industry consortium wrote the book on how to effectively lobby Congress and get legislation passed. But that wasn't the only thing. They also uh, were the sponsors of Norman Bel Geddes architectural design for the 1939 World's Fair in New York City, in Queens, Flushing, Queens, where he built this building, and it was uh, very popular. And in there, there was a track that went around, and spectators would ride the track and look at this model of this futuristic city. So this is in 1939, and they were looking at what the city was going to look like in 1960. So they were imagining uh, just 20 years into the future and separating traffic from pedestrian zones, traffic below. Let's see what we have here. Cities have fundamentally altered how they built themselves over the last 60 years. And to me, the, the place that it really started 1939 World's Fair at what was the most successful World's Fair in history, the most successful exhibit was one called Future Rome. To help us get a glimpse into the future of this unfinished world of ours that has been created for the New York World's Fair, a thought-provoking exhibit of the developments ahead of us, a vivid tribute to the American scheme of living, come Let's travel into the future. What 
will we see? Futurama portrayed the future of the city in that distant year, 1960. The world we are now seeing is a vision, an artistic conception which may undergo many changes as it develops into the great realities of tomorrow. And it portrayed a city that was car-driven, lots of open spaces. You could live in the country and drive to your job downtown, and you'd have the best of two worlds. Over space, man has begun to win victory. Suburban splendor and urban excitement. Uh, not coincidentally, Futurama was sponsored by General Motors, and they were promoting what we wanted. And it's my sense that 1939, just before the war, the clouds are looming over Europe. We go off to war, and we have this image that's mulling in our minds, and we come back, and we implement Futurama. Fifteen million GIs came back from the war, clamoring for new homes and a piece of land in the country. Almost overnight, suburbia was born. You get the idea. Um, so, and part of this relationship, uh, so Corbusier produced a document with the Congress, International Congress, the, uh, what's the English version of Siam? The International Congress of Modern Architecture produced a plan under Corbusier's direction uh, that uh, became the blueprint for reconstruction after the war. So in 1934, they produced the Athens Charter. Then, uh, and GM is producing things like Futurama. It didn't end in 1939 with this exhibition. They created a traveling roadshow that would pack up and go to cities throughout the United States. And one of the the great events of, if you lived in a town in the Midwest, would be the week that the Futurama show would be arriving in your town. And the Futurama show updated uh, yearly and kept going into the 60s. Um, so there, there were these multiple uh, planning uh, visions that were appealing to the popular imagination about what the future was going to be like. And then there's, who saw, uh, who, who framed Roger Rabbit? Is that the name of the movie? It's a good movie, right? What's the central premise? Who's the villain? What did he do? Do you remember? He bought the red car line in Los Angeles in order to destroy it. Crazy, right? It turns out that General Motors, Firestone, Phillips Petroleum, and a few other automobile-related uh, companies funded this small two-bus, two brothers. They had two buses in, in Minnesota. They fed money to them to be the front organization for a group called National City Lines for a company. And here's they. it turns out they, um, they went with all this money from the automobile industry, they went from city to city and they purchased the streetcar lines in 83 cities and towns in the United States. I think this is queued up in the right place. They had to find something they could put in place for the streetcar.
they acquired interest in the New York railways, and between 1926 and 1936, they methodically destroyed the rails. When they were finally motorized New York, General Motors issued these, these ads throughout the country. This is important because they're trying to show that motorization is the wave of the future. They issued these ads and said, the motorization of Fourth and Madison is the most important and epical event in the history of community transportation. So cutting to the chase, National City Lines uh, purchased the streetcar companies in 83 cities. I could see what was happening. They did it in Baltimore, they did it in Philadelphia, they did it in Los Angeles. Come in and do a job. So they and pulled five gallons of kerosene went to <coughs> every trolley, put a torch to it, and that's the way it went. So uh, they were uh, brought to court in the forties. They were, they, were, uh, they were convicted and charged $5,000 each company, and the officers of the companies were charged $1 each. And the infrastructure that they removed from cities in order to promote the sales of automobiles would cost something like, it's, it was been estimated at $300 billion today. And we know that because in Baltimore, in Los Angeles, in the Twin Cities, in Minnesota, uh, in Boston, a lot of these uh, rail lines have been replaced. And it cost many, many multiples hot more than uh, it would have cost to just save them. Um, so um, there's, if you if you are a member of the Facebook group, these videos are there in full. Uh, for you to watch if you are interested in this topic, but we don't have time. So the, the field of planning splintered off from architecture. And architecture as a discipline as we know it is now a fraction of what it used to be. It used to be that architecture dealt with the design of cities and towns. But uh, it split off and became planning and architecture. Planning, a big part of planning, as you can tell from uh, growing up in the United States, uh, became an, uh, dominated by transportation planning. And in schools of transportation planning and engineering throughout the United States, transportation planning became a euphemism for automobile transportation planning. The cutting edge throughout the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and to today to some extent, the cutting edge of transportation planning theory was eliminate the mass transit, embarrassment of mass transit, where people have to share space and inside a, a vehicle, and, in, and replace it with modern, efficient uh, auto, private automobile planning. And the main idea in the planning schools was you predict where demand is going to, uh, is likely to come from, and before there is demand, you supply the freeway system. And you, uh, and so that's called predict and provide. And the first um, freeway built in the United States was the Pasadena uh, freeway, from downtown Los Angeles to Pasadena, and Within four months of the opening of the Pasadena Freeway, something very startling happened. Traffic jams. If, I, if we had more time, I would have played you the part uh, in the film, the historic footage, uh, where people were saying, knowing that it was true, that the number one reason to install freeways was to get rid of traffic jams. You know, these, these arterial streetcar line, uh, avenues with streetcars on it, they would get clogged with cars. And so you need a freeway to abolish forever any possibility of, of traffic jams. So that was the logic of the first freeway in Pasadena is to get rid of traffic jams. Four months after it opened, 
it started to have traffic jams. And uh, engineers at the time came up with the concept, this is 1934, they came up with the concept of induced, uh, induced traffic. So when you provide, and this comic summarizes it, so uh, I don't have to say it, you, know, you, you have two lanes of traffic, it's obvious what needs to happen, you need to widen the road. And then you get three lanes of traffic, and within six months, this, the, um, the general trend is within six months after widening the road, you're back to the identical condition you had previously. And so what do you do if you're following this logic? You change it to four lanes, you change it to five lanes, and continue. You just make it, this is the logic of, uh, of that. And uh, what is the logical outcome of that sequence, especially when you apply it to parking as well. If there's not enough parking, you make more parking. Uh, so, and if that fills up, then you make more parking. Think about where that takes us, and we're going to see images of that in a minute. In the meantime, here's a huge topic that we don't have time to talk about, and I apologize for not giving it the attention it deserves. Uh, I'm deeply influenced by a book I learned about on Monday. I'm almost finished reading it now. Uh, it is startling and breathtaking, the uh, evidence that we're all ignorant of, of what happened while we were in the name of gearing up and transportation of automobiles. This other thing that we consider to be collateral damage turns out to be one of the primary drivers of building freeways and engaging in urban renewal uh, in the post-war period and before the war, it has to do with segregation, uh, race segregation. So uh, World War II, we won the war by gearing up our industrial uh, machinery, and we just kicked butt in terms of industrial production. So what happens when you win the war and you have all this industrial capacity, what do you do? Well, the standard history that you may have gotten in high school, and in this class, always before today, was you turn to consumer goods. You, instead of making tanks and jeeps, you make cars. And you start producing the suburbs to improve the housing. Because housing was neglected during the war years, you weren't allowed to build, build housing unless it was for war uh, munitions factories, et cetera. And so there was a backlog of housing demand and this new consumer product that was going to be available for everyone. So you shift the whole industrial infrastructure towards consumer goods. Um, and the Veterans Administration uh, and the newly formed uh, mortgage insurance uh, agencies of the United States invented this thing called the mortgage that after 15, then 25, and now 30 years typically, of paying your mortgage every month, you own the house at the end. It was a revolutionary principle. You can get tax subsidies. And so it became extremely inexpensive for anyone living in the city, anyone returning from the war. Uh, there were special programs. It was almost impossible to refuse. You either pay much more money and stay in the crowded cities, or you move out of the crowded cities and move to these new suburbs with good schools, um, uh, and it would cost you less, actually. And everyone could do that, unless you weren't white. So in, in 1866, the Civil War ended, and they passed the 13th and 14th Amendments, and it said, not only are all slaves freed, but any up any device that would create a second class citizen is illegal, non-constitutional from that point forward. And for 10 years, uh, the free, newly freed slaves moved wherever they wanted to, got jobs, they were farmers, they owned land, and there was a, a large degree of integration <coughs> only because US federal troops remained in the South to enforce 
this transition called Reconstruction. But something happened in 1877, only 10 years after the end of the Civil War, where uh, there was a contested presidential election. And in order to, as a part of the deal, the anti-slavery North forces were given the presidency in exchange for a deal. You got to remove all these federal troops out of the South. So they made the deal. The anti-slavery North got the presidency in Rutherford B. Hayes, and all the troops left the South. And immediately, the conditions of slavery were recreated through violence, uh, murder, uh, intimidation, and we got the Jim Crow era, which uh, started very dis abruptly in 1877, and it ended, uh, when did it end? We're not sure when it ends. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe it hasn't. Some people would say it ended in 1854 with Brown versus Board of Education. Some would say it ended with the Civil Rights Movement in the 1960s. Some would say, well, Barack Obama was president. We're, we're good. Mission accomplished. Um, but there's a lot of evidence to make this troubling. So we don't have time to do this justice. Just know that here were some of the, this is just Wikipedia, right? What are the, first of all, United States and South Africa, they're right there next to each other. Uh, South Africa is a special place in the history of the world. Um, and so in, in 1917, uh, the Supreme Court, to its credit, said, you can't create race zones in your zoning. Because remember planning? We were just talking about planning. Planning uses the tool of zoning where you color a map and you say, this zone is for one use, this zone is for a different use, and in order to have that use be protected, you gotta separate it from this other use. Well, until 1917, there were colored areas and non-colored, and white areas. And that was one of the principal uses of zoning. But in 1917, the Supreme Court said, no, that creates second-class citizenship. You can't do that. And they said, okay, our mistake, we're gonna, so they just crossed out the words colored and white, and they said, um, high value housing, medium value housing, low value housing, commercial industry. Those are the zones, right? And so in the name of preserving the economic value of real estate, uh, segregation continued on. Uh, this is the book I've been reading this week. It talks about, these are the redlining maps that were produced. Um, it didn't say, black, white, it said fourth grade housing, first grade housing. And so here we are, where are we? We're on this map uh, at Wentworth. But basically, it, this converted later to, um, so these are in, uh, the Federal Housing Authority insurance maps. <coughs> And their handbooks were explicit. They said, you are not allowed to guarantee the mortgage on real estate in a neighborhood that is, has any black families in it or is near a neighborhood with black families. There was a neighborhood in Detroit where the, the, con the, the developers said, no, I promise I won't sell to any black families. And this is in the 50s. And the Federal Housing Authority said, no, 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 you're right next to a black neighborhood. You, we were not gonna give you the loans. We're not gonna guarantee your loans. He said, no, I promise, I'll never let. And he said, okay, how about this? What if I build a wall? Sound familiar? We're back to, <coughs> I'm gonna build a wall. And so he built a wall that was a foot thick, six feet high, and a half mile long. And he said, look, I built the wall, and they said, Okay, we'll give you the loan. And there's Detroit. Is, is uh, Jim Crow segregation over or not? So basically the, the larger theme that you should recognize is that there was explicit racial segregation 
And then there was slightly less explicit racial segregation in the name of economic, uh, preserving economic value of real estate. And then there was slightly less explicit segregation. And we're in one of those shades of gray of slightly less economic segregation. Next chapter, the 1956 Interstate Highway Act used military, remember the uh, automobile industry lobby, uh, lobbying Congress? They did a very good job convincing the US government that it was a matter of uh, national defense that we'd be able to mobilize populations and military personnel and uh, weaponry across the country on short notice. And so they, they used the defense uh, rationale as a justification for the interstate highway system. The big question was, what do you do when you get to a city? Do you take that freeway right through the city or do you back off? Well, in New York City, Robert Moses um, became the most powerful man never elected to office. He was um, the big planner who planned all the infrastructure uh, for New York City. So here's, um, and it became a cultural dream of driving across the country. Um, but here's uh, Robert Moses. He started in New York City, but then eventually ended up uh, doing the entire New York State. He became buddies with Ro uh, John Kennedy, the president. And he was one of the most influential freeway planners. Urb he was big force behind urban renewal. And he uh, developed the World's Fair where the Futurama occurred. Um, to make a long story short, uh, he and other transportation planners sold the idea of putting freeways through the cities in part because it would solve the black neighborhood problem. Once you have the maps that show um, high value residential and low value residential, and you need to bring a highway through the city, where are you gonna put that? Where are you gonna put that highway? Well, you put the highway right on the edge of the low value residential, black communities, the ghetto, uh, in order to clear out the ghetto and create a barrier between uh, the highest value housing, white neighborhoods, and lower value housing, the black neighborhoods. And so one of the arguments, it wasn't just collateral damage, it turns out that was one of the chief arguments used to justify uh, putting a freeway through certain parts of the city, and that was extended to this idea of urban renewal. So I know the two words, urban renewal, are English language words, and they have meanings. And you could put those two words together, and it means renewing the urban fabric, right? But when you put those two words together, you should treat it like it's a capital U and a capital R, because historically, it is a thing. Urban renewal is a historical force, and when you say, I'm interested in promoting urban renewal, it's like showing, it's like being a Hindu showing a swastika. You don't know you're offending most people, but it has meanings beyond the simple English language meanings. Urban renewal was a devastating chapter in the history of the United States. Jane Jacobs is perhaps the most important figure in this course. There should have been a reading on her this week. Sorry about that. If you read a book uh, related to this course, this is the book you should read. Your studio instructors have already been referring to it. You just don't remember it because you didn't know, right? Who, who's heard their studio instructor refer to Jane Jacobs? One. Who's heard their studio instructor to refer to the concept of eyes on the street? Eyes on the street? Oh, different, different. Um, that's all Jane Jacobs. She was this housewife uh, who didn't, you know, she was no expert. They would dismiss her as some housewife. But she took on Robert Moses and defeated him to a large extent. Um, and his freeway through uh, Washington Square Park in Lower Manhattan was defeated. That's all she gets. Um, so what's the space 
of the car and what does that mean? When you go to design uh, an office building, uh, there are certain standards for the design of office buildings when you're doing the programming. First, your, the project architect will say, well, how many employees are going to be here? And the client says, we're going to have uh, 100 employees. And so you're a skilled architect. Now, now I'm putting you in the role of project architect. You look up in your tables and you say, OK, 350 square feet per employee. That's kind of a rough standard. It varies. Don't take my word for it. Um, but that's more or less a typical office worker. That includes the corridors, the copy machine, the microwave, the kitchenette, the bathrooms. Uh, that's the space of one employee, so times 100, uh, 35,000 square feet. Now the next question is, how many of those employees drive, are going to drive to work? How much space per employee's car does it take? 450 square feet. And unlike office space, which you can stack up quite nicely, just a few elevators, some fire stairs, you know, structural core, at very low impact, you can stack those 350 square feet per office worker up into the sky. Um, but how about their cars? What happens when you put a second level on the parking lot? It goes from 450 square feet per car to 600 square feet per car. So it's, it's good to keep those cars low and on the ground. And the old stores, this is the streetcar suburb arrangement where you have a sidewalk and then you have the store part. Right? This is the part where you earn money. The, more, the bigger this is, the more money you earn for both the landowner and the shop owner. But then the parking requirements come in and they say, no, 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 no. You gotta have space for the parking. You can't have people, you can't be overloading our parking here. And so there are requirements for every 1,000 square feet of retail, you need a parking space. That's for the big shopping malls. And then you change those. It's still not enough parking, uh, so you do this. And so you get a lot less store and a lot more parking. And all of a sudden, the distance is, if you want this much store, you, got, you need a bigger store, you need a lot more parking, and the size of parcels suddenly are getting bigger and bigger because you need this. Um, and so that's the logic of the space of the car that caused sprawl, both at the small scale and the larger scale of suburbanization. Um, the Netherlands, who's been to Amsterdam? Awesome, right? So believe it or not, the United States, US cities and Dutch cities automobilized kind of together until the 1970s when people in the United States said, whoa, 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 what's happening to my city? And then they got brushed off and they went silent. But the people in Amsterdam said, whoa, 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 what's happening to my city? And they won. And so the difference between Amsterdam and Boston has to do with this turning point in the 1970s where they were filling in the canals of Amsterdam to produce wider streets and more parking on the logic of automobile geometries that we just looked at. Here's one of the actual uh, data visualizations that they produced in order to convince people that they had a problem. Street full of cars in Amsterdam uh, with these many people being moved compared with the same number of people being moved in a bus. Compared with the same number of people on bicycles, compared with the same number of people walking on the sidewalk. So you go from zero space available to 100% of the street space available. Specific geometries and architecture that come out of this. Um, this is a very clear demonstration of uh, some of the um, Here's, this happens to be Boston. We don't have time for this. I'll put this on Facebook. But um, you can slide this slider across. You can see cities throughout the North America in their former spatial arrangement 
and then after the freeways are cut through. The one for Boston, unfortunately, only has the situation uh, after um, the Rose Kennedy Greenway. But here's what happens when you follow the logic. Remember, transport, the rules of transportation planning and engineering <coughs> is when you have too much traffic congestion, you add another lane to the road. When you don't have enough parking, you add more parking. To the point where downtown Houston has 85% of the uh, ground area covered with uh, roads and parking for, to service the 15% that has buildings on it. And there's lots of really uh, dramatic uh, analyses projects available on this topic. This is going to be uh, an easy one, but the, the question is, can you use this as a tool for exploration to figure things out? That's always the question. It's not just about demonstrating how crazy it is. Is it can you figure out what the relationships are between the buildings that are being used and the infrastructure that is being used to serve it? John Travolta's house, it's not enough to have your own single family car, he's just extended this logic to airplanes. I hope quad rotors come in before that. Um, we don't have time for this. This is, um, it talks about the depletion of oil, peak oil, right? But we're not at peak oil. Gas has almost never been cheaper. There's, I'm just going to, you know, what's happening with uh, oil? What happened to peak oil? Do you even know what peak oil is? So what happened to peak oil? It was when we were going to peak. We'll talk. Uh, Trayvon Martin. So the critique of automobile, automobile fabrics. This is back to LA school. Trayvon Martin. I'm going to leave a bunch of just unanswered questions. This was a study done in the 70s. If a street uh, has a lot of traffic, people don't have many social connections. If people has, if the street has very low traffic, turns out people have lots of social connections. It'd be great to find a, an analytical way to perform that kind of a study using our methods in this class. So what happened to you guys, right? We were doing fine, driving more and more and more, and then something happened. Is this the beginning of what uh, John Uri calls uh, a paradigm shift? And what's up with the real estate market? They're starting to publish these walkability maps where the real estate value, the value of a piece of real estate goes up if your neighborhood is considered to be highly walkable. So things are shaking up. This is, uh, you know those traffic bumps that are such a pain in the butt when you're driving? Well, they grew up and they became traffic calming where the, the road goes like this to just slow people down because the police are not going to enforce the speed limit. Engineering signals are the thing that make us slow down when we're, we're in our driver brain. Right? So now we're going to take that up a notch and now we have complete streets. Since you've been at school, the streets of Boston have been transformed by the complete streets movement. This is an important thing. We got no time. Okay. One more thing. This is the way cars and motor vehicles were first introduced into the rest of the world, what we used to call the third world, increasingly developed, developing world. This is the rise of automobile ownership in the United States under conditions of the General Motors lobby, et cetera. Um, 750 vehicles per 1,000 population. It's starting to go down. This is out of date. And back when this was done in 1995, Bangladesh, China, India, Brazil, they all had like, China had five cars per 1,000 population. Has that changed since in the last 20 years? Yeah. They produce more cars than the United States does now, I believe. Now, there's a big story about Japan that is quite interesting. Um, so the U.S. and Allied forces won World War II. Uh, we did it by devastating Japan in part. And 
uh, Japan was very confused when we just didn't walk away or enslave people. Uh, they were confused by the flood of money coming into Japan to rebuild Japan. Because we're not stupid. We used to be not stupid. And we rebuilt Japan so that they wouldn't go to war with us anymore. Now they're a highly valued trade partner. right? So they were confused. Why are you giving us money? We were at war with you. And they were very confused about this aid thing. But then, right after World War II, we had another war to fight in Korea. You've heard of Korea because we're about to fight another war there. So we had to fight the war in Korea, and we needed Jeeps. And so we said, hey, Japan, how about if you produce a lot of Jeeps and other military vehicles to supply our war effort in Korea? So the Japanese automobile industry uh, the foundations of it were built during the Korean War, building vehicles uh, for that war. And uh, the U.S., during those years, the U.S. planners were going over and saying, hey, we're going to rebuild Japan. We're going to make it better than it ever was. We're going to build you. Don't thank us too much. We're going to build you an interstate highway system just like ours. Okay, now you can thank us. And they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're Japan. We can't. We, we don't have all the space in the world like you did. We have this huge population. We have mountains. We value our forests. They're sacred. Thanks, but no thanks. We recognize that our capacity to expand economically depends on our ability to move around the island. Your highway system, this was already in the late 40s, your highway system is completely dysfunctional uh, if you tried to build that in Japan. We'll build railways instead. Thank you very much. So uh, fast forward to the end of the Korean War. There's all this industrial infrastructure. They, the, uh, the, the Jeep manufacturers want to do what the US did, is switch from military manufacture to civilian consumer manufacturing cars. <coughs> and the Japanese government said, whoa, whoa, whoa. No. We actually want to restrict the number of cars that the Japanese citizens can own. And then some brilliant man reminded everybody, hey, remember the United States? Remember that aid thing that we thought was so crazy? Maybe what we can do is we can become the largest foreign aid contributor for development projects, or deal with the most countries in the world. Even though we're a tiny country with a tiny population, we can deal with all the developing world, and we can give them aid, and they can thank us. We can help them develop road systems. They can have an interstate highway system in Thailand. Remember Thailand? Who's been to Bangkok? How's the traffic there? It's so much. Yeah. So let's build highways for Thailand. Then let's build factories. For, let's build Nissan and Datsun and Toyota factories in Thailand so we can sell cars. And that's why Bangkok had so much traffic that they need to build a subway system above the ground just to keep things going. Guess who designed and built and financed that subway system? Japan. And it worked so beautifully in Thailand that they did it in Indonesia. Philippines, and they're trying to do it everywhere. And you heard about the bus rapid transit system in Bogota, Colombia. That was when Mayor Penalosa said, no thank you. We'll take your money, we'll build a, a bus system, a bus rapid transit system, but we don't want your highway system. And that's how he got elected to mayor of Bogota, Colombia. So ring roads are a Japanese project. They will finance it, they will engineer it, they will help plan it. And now, the whole world is the United States when it comes to automobility. Even before we get to 700, remember the United States is somewhere now, it's around 700 cars per 1,000 people. This is the traffic situation when the 5 to 10 percent wealthiest people start to get access to cars. And uh, you get... Uh, you get 120, 150 cars per 1,000 people. This is your situation. And there are 
planners and otherwise intelligent people, not just from Japan, but also from the United States, from schools like these, who go there and say, well, your problem is this. And we deal with this up in the thesis studio because we have people from other parts of the world. Planners are going to the mayors and the councils and the planners of these cities and they're saying, traffic problems? It's because to have a, a properly functioning city, you need 35% of your land area to be for, for roads. Your problem is you only have 6% of your land area for roads. Of course you have traffic jams. Now it's time to bulldoze and have some urban renewal. Uh, bulldoze your older neighborhoods and build more roads. And so now automobility is not just a US problem, it's a global problem. And the race is, can we take the lessons we've learned that have given us complete streets and overcome the, the cultural message that we've been sending loud and clear pre, for the 20th century that this is, you just need to build more roads and more parking. So that's the current, and that will determine to a large extent whether humans can occupy the planet in the future or whether global climate change, because there's, a, some people argue that if you put together the automobile with the suburbanization that is associated with the automobile, there is nothing that has contributed more to global climate change and carbon uh, impact on the planet than what we just talked about during this lecture. So we're out of time. To be continued. Check out those videos on uh, Facebook to get a deeper story. Jackie, you had a question. sometimes and they send you a ticket in the mail yeah. in some places. It's all RoboCop, right? You get a bill in the mail. You get a bill in the mail with a photograph of you driving and it's clearly you with your driving license plate and a $40 ticket. Do you guys need to come to class? What's up? No, don't even say. I know it's bad, but anyway, we fixed our schedule. We, we opened a Starbucks for them, five to five to nine membership, and then to this day, we're not so bad coming in. Uh -huh. So, but anyway, we fixed our schedule, and we're not on Fridays, and we're not on Excuses. Okay. Excuses. That's, that's, that at least counts for every single. Excuses. Exactly.